Are you ready to take a bite out of the competition? Are you looking for ideas to make your business better? Welcome to the Core Business Show with Tim GK, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. At the core of every successful business, you'll find people making a difference. And with each episode of the Core Business Show, we talk with those people, examine those ideas, and explore the strategies that make them special. Now, the host of the Core Business Show, Tim Jacquet. Good morning and welcome to another edition of the Core Business Show. I'm Tim Jacquet, your host. Our topic today is Car Care for the Clueless, Successful Use for Car Buying, one-on-one with Pam Oaks. We're going to have Pam Oaks on the line in a few seconds. We're going to take a break and listen to a word from our sponsor. We'll be back in one minute. I'm Tim Jacquet, your host, the Core Business Show. Thank you for listening. You're listening to the Core Business Show, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. Apple Capital Group in Jacksonville, Florida, is a commercial lender that specializes in asset-based loans, equipment leasing and financing, invoice financing, commercial real estate loans, and asset-based financing in the U.S. and Canada. Apple Capital Group is a direct lender that lends on their private equity investment portfolio. Ninety percent of most loans are decided within two hours, and vendor funding within 24 hours after documents are completed with a one-page application. No slow no's, just a quick decision and a fast yes. To get more information about lending from Apple Capital Group, call 866-611-7457. That's 866-611-7457 to speak with one of our loan specialists. Or visit us right now at applecapitalgroup.com. Welcome back to The Core. Once again, here's Tim Jacquet. Welcome back with The Core. I'm Tim Jacquet, your host. Today, again, our topic is going to be car care for the clueless. Pam, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Good morning. Good morning. A lot of people like to hear personal stories on how people, instead of reading the bio, is really let the person tell their own story, how they actually uh, got started and what led you into uh, this new book. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, yes, I'm a fourth-generation automotive technician. I'm an automotive author of several books, automotive patent holder. i uh, have a uh, 60 second car care for the coolest daily edition across the U.S. every morning on various stations. And I just grew up on the east side of Detroit. I mean, that was kind of maybe like a prerequisite <laughs> to grow up on the east side of Detroit. You know, you just had the automotive thing just slid right in there. But actually, seriously, my great grandfather, he gave me my first lesson on an automobile. He uh, taught me how to set the choke on a 69 Plymouth. I remember Sunday there watching that. and he was one of those people, along with, of course, my dad, was, watch what I'm doing. This is how you do this. And I was very fortunate to grow up in that atmosphere. And a little side note there, that 69 Plymouth, I still have that car today. <laughs> is that the car that's on the cover of your uh, book? Or is it different? No, actually, that's uh, a 63 uh, Galaxy, and my great-grandfather had one of those as well. Wow. So that was the rest of me red. He had an arrest me red, but it looked a lot better with that yellow on the book. Wow, so the wow. The automotive industry, I just love it. Wow, so it's in your blood. Yes, it is. You know, going through the book real quick, kind of tell us what got you to, I know you, you're you syndicating and you've been doing several other books. What got you actually time to write this particular book in Car Care for the Coolest? Well, actually, I had a shop for 20 years, which I just sold two weeks ago. Wow, that was my goal. 20 years. Thank you. 20 years and... It was time to do other automotive things that I really hold dear to my heart. And one of these is educating consumers. I saw a lot in those 20 years. And that included people coming in or not coming in to have their vehicle inspected before they purchased it. You would not believe I've seen lug nuts literally glued onto the rim to appear to make that all was intact. I've seen people use duct tape in ways that were quite inventive. (laughs) I have seen things patched, you name it. And the consumer really needs an advocate out there. And they actually can be their own advocate. And that's by before finding out that bottom line, you make sure that you have that vehicle bumper-to-bumper inspected by an ASU certified technician. And I'm not talking about having your old Uncle Doug come out with you because he used to work on cars 30 years ago. I'm talking about an up-to-date, 
presently certified technician at an ASU Blue Field shop, a reputable shop, an independent person looking at a car over bumper to bumper. I'll give you a quick story. A friend of mine, very, very dear, they wanted to get uh, a year or two old car. And he heeded my words. In fact, he called me up Friday night, like 9 o'clock at night. So, would you come down and look at this car? And I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Friday night, 9 o'clock. Plus, we need a lift. We need to get this thing up there, take a look at it. Mm-hmm. He says, well, I got one of those online, those online reports, and it says everything's fine with it. And I says, great. I says, just bring it in the morning. We'll take a look at it. Popped it up in the air. Everything looks fine. Open the trunk, and you could see, because... We know from being in the industry for so long that the weld around the trunk, you could see where it was uh, robotic generated, and then you could see where it was human generated on the other side. And I told myself, this car has been in an accident. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not what the report said. It says it's accident for you. I said, I'm telling you, it's been in an accident. There's a human weld there. They had a problem. Something happened. So he bought the car anyway. Yeah, it was a pretty good deal. They were selling it pretty reasonable. They had it under 10,000 miles, and it was two years old. It was, it was a good deal for them. Mm-hmm. But about two weeks later, I get this phone call, and it goes, hey, guess what? The car was in an accident. <laughs> and I said, how did you get? And evidently, something slid along in the trunk, along the side where it goes to the trunk uh, bottom is there to the uh, quarter panel. Mm-hmm. And they found little pieces of the safety glass. Wow. This was negotiating money for him, if he had listened to me, that the car was in an accident, that we could prove it. We could actually prove it. You know, another thing, too, is people who are purchasing cars, having them inspected beforehand, if they find that the brake pads are going to be need to be replaced soon or it needs tires pretty soon or belts or what have you, just general maintenance, this is all negotiating money for the consumer. The consumer can go back and say, hey, I'm going to have to spend $500 on tires. Do you want to put them on, or are you going to give me $500 off this vehicle? It's all money in your wallet. Found money. That's why it's so important to have the vehicle checked over before purchase. So when you actually have the vehicle itself, I mean, they're certified vehicles from the manufacturer. Is there any integrity with those certified vehicles? Let me give you another word story. Okay. Another customer of mine wanted a European model, a couple of years old. Actually, it turned out to be uh, three and a half years old, European model. Had a lot of highway miles on it, they said. He purchased it. It was about 100 miles away. I told him to have it checked out before he bought it. He says, no, it's got this 106-point inspection. Everything shows fine. Drove it down the highway, got back in town, and the oil light came on. Drove it over to the shop, and I looked at the oil, and the oil was more than a quart low, and it was black as coal. And I went, wow, really? So I said, let's check this thing out, found the lift, and we looked, and the inside of the tires actually had the steel belt. The cord was coming out. Hmm. And then we checked the front end out, and the left lower ball joint was actually starting to pop out of the vehicle. It was bad. I mean, you could also see where the vehicle had been in an accident. And this was a certified vehicle from the dealership, a European dealership, a European certified car. So, you know, it all depends upon who's inspecting that used car when it comes in to get that certification. You know, if they have been properly trained, yes, you could maybe get away with it. But, you know, there's nothing like spending $50 to have an independent shop look that thing over. Because in this particular customer's case with the European car, he was stuck for the repairs because he signed an as-is clause when he purchased the car. As-is is as-is, and that's it. He had to fork out that money. Now, some dealers, I know franchise dealerships usually really care about the reputations. Most of them, and I guess if you claim loud enough and up to the ladder loud enough, they, they go ahead and unwind the deal. Do you see that in some cases when you really point something out to somebody and they go back to a franchise dealership and, and really complain about it? If you catch it before you purchase it. Okay. On um, used vehicles, say 99.9%, they're going to have a clause in there 
for the consumers as is. Or they'll have a warranty, but it's not a warranty for what they call wearable items, like tires, brakes, belts, hoses. Those are all wearable items. And there will be a clause in there that they'll have a warranty, but not for wearable items. And that's where the consumer, again, can get burned. And that's why it's so important to have it checked out beforehand. Wow. When it comes actually to, for example, I think the, the first case you mentioned regarding the Carfax report and so forth, I mean, they're not really accurate. It depends if it gets reported or not or the claim gets reported. That's exactly. That's it. If the claim gets reported. I know three cars right now off the top of my head roaming around my city here that if you pull up the Carfax report, it will show that everything's okie dokie. And that's not because I know these three cars have been in fender vendors, but the repairs were done by the individual and not reported to the insurance company. Okay. Other common things, that, uh, common things you've actually seen dealing with vehicles that can, uh, come through your shop that people should be aware of? Sport cars. And we're going to see them again this spring. It doesn't matter what time of the year it is. Blood cars can come from anywhere. They can come from Florida, California, you name it. Wherever there's water and people get their cars involved in it, they can become a flood car. People don't want to pay for that extra comprehensive and collision. When they're getting flood and their car is totaled, they don't want to lose that equity. And sometimes they'll do things like change the carpet out and have the seats cleaned, things like this. And they'll try to mask it. Or if they trade it into a dealership and they won't deem it a flood car, they'll do the same, change the carpet out. It's very easy to change carpet out in the car, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Change the carpet out, you know, do things like that. Well, the underlying horror story is not only do the carpet, the seat, possibly the seats get involved in flood water, all that wiring in the vehicle. There's a ton of wiring underneath that carpet. And when that wiring is exposed to water, it creates corrosion. You have corrosion. You're going to have electrical issues, major electrical issues later on. That's just the start of it. Mm -hmm. We're not even going to go in the steering, suspension, brake components, things like that, exhaust. But see, a professionally trained set of eyes, an AFC certified tech, is going to be able to see if this was a flood car or not. There's, it's pretty obvious to us when we get it up on the lift, up in the air 12 feet, and we can see what's going on, that we can tell the consumer if it's a go or a no-go to purchase that vehicle. Now, can a, talk about a flooded car, can the really flooded cars can be savage, or is really nothing you really can do? Nothing too much you can do. I mean, unless you get the salvage title, and you are aware that it had been a flood car, and you are willing to take the risk, along with owning a flood car, the increased maintenance, of course, you know, because of corrosion from the water and, you know, the electrical and everything, you're willing to take that risk. I mean, they're out there, but you have to have an upfront dealership, which 99.9% .9 are, don't get me wrong, but you need to protect yourself to make sure because sometimes just like that certified car going through and getting its okie dokie, it really wasn't okay. You know, it depends upon the guy that they have in the back, how well mm -hmm. they have him trained, and how well he goes through the car. You know, if they're trying to push 10 cars on him a day, and he's just rushing through them. He might be missing key components that would mark that car okay to drive or if it was a flood car. Uh, so if your car personally floods and you get it repaired, I mean, if you can salvage it, I've seen some insurance companies will just go ahead and pay to have a resavage and actually total out the car. Does the person really have recourse on that, or if they just go with the insurance company and say, okay, we're just going to do the repairs? Can it be really, really repaired? Cheaper. That's how bad it was flooded. Okay. You know, I've had vehicles that had been involved in floods, towed into the shop that, I mean, it's just after a day or two, the mold and mildew that sets into the carpet in the seat is unbelievable. And that's another thing. You've got to think of the environmental issue within the cab of the vehicle. That's not going to be safe to inhale those fumes. I mean, it's mold, mildew, it's toxic. So, you know, you even have to look not at the drivability, but is it safe for the occupants within inside the cab of the vehicle? There's several issues, and, you know, it's going to be a case-by-case uh, -case basis. 
depending upon how bad the car was flooded, if it was minimal, or if it was catastrophic, and that person's going to have to deal with their insurance company, or they're going to have to bite the bullet and get another car. When it comes to really savage cars, you mentioned as well, I mean, you always can tell that the car has been savage because I'm sure those things would get reported, but is it really safe and a person actually buy a savage car? Well, if they have the salvage title and they're aware of what has happened to the vehicle and how it was put together, mm-hmm. I mean, they need to be aware of this, and they will be when they get the salvage title. It will say salvage right on that title. But there's another case I remember um a vehicle coming in, and they just restored it. It happened to me so here in Red Runner as well. This mm-hmm. vehicle, and they did a very nice job on it. And we put it up on a knee lift to uh, swap tires out on it, and the car literally started bending in half. Ooh. And what they had done is they had put two cars together. They didn't do it very well, obviously. And at first, the um, customer was blaming the lift. <laughs> I'm thinking they should thank God that Lyft did this because had you been in an accident, somebody could have gotten seriously hurt or killed. And then we had him bring the person who did the body work over because I just happened to have my phone there that day, and we put it up on the lift. I said, see, all day long. I said, then I explained to him, you know, the, the body work involved that they had to do to make a tight seam, and that wasn't done. So in this case, the guy had no salvage title. He was not aware that he had two salvage plastic cars put together. And that was dangerous, especially the way that they did it. And he was unaware. So there again, before you buy the car, you need to have it checked out professional because if you put it up on the lift, you would have saw that immediately. Okay. So I guess if we could just go segue into your book itself. You've actually outlined a lot of things. I think this is during your career and owning the shop. Uh, yes, actually, and, you know, I still have my dealer's license. That's actually what prompted me to write this book and this car care for the coolest series. I see a lot at the auction. Wow. And uh, people need to be aware of what happened at the auction and how a lot of the dealers that, I mean, the car said, don't get me wrong, but they're not AFC certified technicians. Mm-hmm. So they don't know a lot of the nuances with some of the vehicles and things that can go wrong and things that are going wrong at the time. And they are in good faith because of what they understand. They're selling this car to the consumer. And that's why it's important to check it out. You know, other things that I have in the book there, too, is before you buy a car, you know, this isn't going down buying shoes or a dress or golf clubs. This is something that you need to really take in consideration. This is a major purchase. You know, some people say that your house is your biggest investment. I think it's your car. You're going to purchase many, many vehicles throughout your lifetime, mm-hmm. maybe one or two or three houses in your lifetime versus. So it's important that when you get this car that it fits you well, while you drive, you need to rent an equivalent so you can drive for the weekend. Go to the grocery store, pick up the kids at school, you know, go on an hour trip, see how you fit in this car. Furthermore, you have to like what color it is because you're going to be looking at it for four or five years to get your money back out of it, of course. And of course, you want to look at all aspects of maintenance. How often are you going to have to take it in for major maintenance? manufacturers, they have a dealer schedule, and then they have a factory schedule from the engineers. You always go off the factory maintenance schedule. Believe it or not, it's broken down into two, severe duty or light duty, normal duty driving. I'm a severe duty driver. I drive in stop and go traffic. The temperature is above 90. I drive less than 10 miles in one way. Severe duty driving. My parents, they left five houses down for me. They go farther than 10 miles in one direction. They do not do stopping their traffic, and they happen to be snowbirds, so they're only down at their house during the cooler months of the year. Mm -hmm. They would be considered a normal duty driver. So this is a conversation you're going to have to have with your tech before the purchase or even after the purchase, which is very important to keep this maintenance up, to keep money in your wallet. Another thing, too, is that you have to take into consideration is how much insurance this vehicle is going to cost you. 
Is it going to cost you more for car A or is it going to be car B where it's a little bit less but still looks about the same as car A and has the same features that you want? That's another way to keep money in your wallet. There's a whole step-by-step process on buying a car because when it gets right down to it, you need to go out that door and you need to look at that car and say, you know what? I really like that car. I'm so glad I bought it. Because when that love affair is over, that's when you hear that little squeak and you let it go. Or you hear that rattle and you let it go. And those squeak and rattle, they domino into something big. And that something big is just going to suck money right out of your wallet. So you've got to like what you buy. Okay. In the book you have, you have down here is looking for the bells and whistles. Looking past the bells and the whistles. And you mentioned by going to a tech to make sure that the car checks out clean. Exactly. Just like we were talking before, we had to go bumper to bumper. I had a case one time where uh, a used car dealership, they came in with a consumer with a car and had it checked out. And they advised me that I couldn't drive the car on the road because of the insurance. Well, guess what? My shop insurance covers me for a test drive. We were definitely going on a test drive after that comment. Mm -hmm. And what it all boiled down to, we was having transmission issues. And fortunately for the consumer, you know, we noticed this immediately, this poor shifting, this poor shift quality. And we advised the consumer to keep on looking for another vehicle. Are there some cars that are better used cars, domestic or import or foreign? Uh, hey, yeah, this is actually a good investment car. It has been taken care of. I mean, it has maintained well, you know, like luxury cars have been. Are there some cars that's better than others? Some people will say maybe the imports are pretty good, the Toyotas and Hondas, or because they would just last, last, last. Is that a true case or that's really any car? That was maybe a true case maybe 25, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, the car companies are so interconnected with each other that, for an example, people didn't know up through 2010, the Toyota Corolla and the Chevy Malibu were literally made in the same plant in Fullerton, California. Matter of fact, Tesla's in that plant now. (laughs) But people don't understand how the car companies, how they interact with each other. And like I said, 25, 30 years ago, yes, more so there were cars out there that were, how would you say, more productive, less maintenance, can go 200,000 miles, 300,000 miles and not worry. Nowadays, if you maintain your vehicle according to that schedule, you can easily get 200, 250, 300,000 miles out of your vehicle by properly maintaining it when it's due. It's that simple, especially the oil changes. Everybody neglects the oil changes. You do the oil changes per the manufacturer and what the manufacturer recommends. The manufacturer recommends 020, that's what you put in the car. If it recommends 1030, that's what you put in the car. It's nothing fancy, just the ASV or that, excuse me, that SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers, seal on there, Mm -hmm. on that bottle, and you just have that in your vehicle. There are a multitude of different oils out there. Some of them promise the moon. If you change oil when due, that's what will keep your car on the road and keep money in your wallet. What about supplements like STP or something like that into the gas? The only recommendation that I have for any supplement in the car is if it has the manufacturer's label, the container. Okay. Ethanol. Yeah. Someone has a question regarding the ethanol mix is which is really corrosive, are they going to have an effect on the car longevity? Let me tell you about ethanol. Ethanol, especially your sputum, and it's a splash blend. So to make it just in layman's terms, they fill the tanker up 90%. The last 10%, they put the ethanol in, and they have the tanker literally mix it to the fuel facility, the gas station. Mm -hmm. So you can get less than 10%, you can get maybe a little more than 10% ethanol when you're pumping that into your tank, depending on where the level of the tank is at the gas station and so on and so forth. There's a lot of variables. Mm -hmm. If you want a quality fuel, back in 2001, 2002, six automobile manufacturers got together. Remember I told you how they they all talked to each other. Mm -hmm. They got together and they said, this 
is the quality of fuel we need in our vehicles to make it run at peak performance, top MPG, and the least amount of emissions. Who's on board? And a handful of petroleum companies came back and said, we can do this. And those six manufacturers, Toyota, Honda, BMW, General Motors, BMW, and Audi, said, great, we're going to call you guys top tier fuel, T-O-P hyphen T-I-E-R. It's not the octane. You can have the lowest octane, the 87 octane, and it's still top tier fuel if you pump from one of these top tier fuel facilities. And you can just Google it. It will give you a whole list. A lot of it's regional. They have national companies in there. And whatever your car calls for, if it just calls for 87 octane, you just put 87 octane in there, and it is a top-tier fuel. That's going to help your vehicle significantly. Some people say shell gas is one of the top-tier fuel. Okay. That's right. That's one one of the top tier. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's one of the other top tiers, yes. Another thing, too, is that... Always make quarter tank your new empty. That's going to keep your car running longer, stronger. Quarter tank's your new empty, and this is why. Fuel, believe it or not, combustible, and it's keeping that hot electric fuel pump cool. Kind of crazy, I know. When it gets warm, it stresses it out. When it gets warm is when you're running on fumes. Running on fumes does two things. It diminishes the life of the fuel pump, and two, if you have an emergency, and even if it's a little minor emergency, it can become a major one when you run out of gas, driving somebody to the doctor's office, having to run over to get your kid out of school because they're sick, or if you have to go to the emergency room. You can get in a big pickle really quick. So keeping quarter tank as your new empty is just money in your wallet. I have a question here regarding cracks in the windshield. Do they really need to be repaired? Of course. And the majority of the states, if you have constant collision on your insurance, mm-hmm. that windshield is free. So please take advantage of it. Yes. Okay, good to know. Regarding, should you always take your car to the dealer in order to make sure that, you know, the integrity of the work has been done? No, because you need to take it to either the dealer or an AFC Blue Seal shop. So in these days, you decide on working on your vehicle. Let me tell you. The ASC certified technician is sitting in the same classroom as that dealership technician when they're getting automotive updates on that much specific manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure if you go to an independent, and there's thousands of excellent mom-and-pop ASC Blue Seal shops out there that have hundreds of years of experience right in the shop alone. My, My shop had over 300 years' experience with all of us in there. I mean... We knew what we were doing, and that's because we were always going to class. I still go to class, and we make sure that we know that vehicle by going to class. And it doesn't matter if the technician is from the dealership or if he's from an independent. You want somebody who knows what they're doing. When they have that ASC certified insignia on their shirt, you know that they have shown proficiency and fixing your automobile net module. Very, very important. Okay. What do you like to leave the audience with regarding your book and advice that you want to leave them regarding buying used cars? Always get a second opinion, Mm -hmm. no matter if it's buying a used car or if it's getting a repair. You get that gut in your feeling, you know, that, I don't know about the gut in your feeling. Always ask the questions, why? Why do I need this repair? And how? How is this going to affect the performance of my vehicle? How is it going to affect my wallet? And all these tidbits, including whether they go to the dealership or independent and how your vehicle works and how to teach yourself how to have your car properly repaired by a certified technician. That's all within these books. And it's all about keeping money in the consumer's wallet and making them a savvy consumer. Perfect. And if they'd like to reach out to you, I know you have a blog as well, website. Yes, it is carcareforthecoolest.com. It's all one word spelled out, carcareforthecoolest.com. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, though, we're revamping it a little bit. We're making it a little bit more consumer-friendly. It's very consumer-friendly now, but we're going to be doing uh, video and everything in it within the next couple of weeks. I'm excited about that. But consumers can go through, and they can click on the interactive form. We have free storm 
car care guides. We have regular car care guides. Just click and print and enjoy it uh, all. You don't have to worry about any copyright or anything. It's all about protecting the consumer and their vehicle. Perfect. Well, I really thank you, Pam, for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. And just give us your website address again and how to contact you. Oh, uh, they can contact me by email. We have it at the top of our webpage. It's carcare the number four coolest at gmail dot com or our webpage at carcare for the coolest all spelled out dot com. Perfect. Thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you. Well, everybody, thank you for listening today to the Core Business Show. I'm Tim J.K., your host, and you can download the show on Blog Talk Radio, iTunes, or on your local radio station. Thank you for listening. Everybody have a great day. Thank you, Pam. Thank you for listening to the Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. For more information about equipment financing and asset-based loans, visit our website, applecapitalgroup.com. That's applecapitalgroup.com. Or call us at 866-611-7457. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. And remember, you can always get to the Core via iTunes. You'll find all our previous episodes there. And thanks again for listening to the Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet.